On 28 February 1962, at Edwards Air Force Base, Chief Warrant Officer E.J. Murray became the first human to eject in the B-58 escape capsule. This event not only provided a brilliantly successful climax to the test program at subsonic speeds, but paved the way for supersonic flight testing of the capsule on which we're about to report. This phase, which was carried out entirely at Edwards by an Air Force General Dynamics Stanley Aviation Team showed a pattern of steady progress punctuated by the appearance of problems in several aspects of the capsule's performance. In the course of their solution, it was occasionally necessary to repeat earlier subsonic tests as well as to conduct some supplementary proving out on the ground. These measures were to ensure fulfillment by the capsule of all specifications, especially that of speed, up to and including Mach 2. Following Warrant Officer Murray's successful feat by less than a month, the first supersonic ejection of the capsule took place on 21 March with a bear as occupant. Speed was Mach 1.3, altitude 35,000 feet. Height of ejection above the B-58 flight pattern was 225 feet. All hardware and instrumentation functioned perfectly. After a descent lasting 7 minutes and 49 seconds, the capsule impacted in the design attitude. On opening the capsule, technical personnel were careful to look immediately for evidence of toxic gas caused by leakage from the ballistic devices or associated plumbing which actuate the unit's various systems. This was a problem which continued to be investigated throughout the supersonic phase of testing. An on-the-spot examination of the bear, together with the usual more careful regime of tests conducted later, showed the animal to be in excellent shape. All in all, the success of the ejection was so complete as to give great encouragement to all concerned, and certainly little hint of trouble to come. On 6 April, a second supersonic capsule ejection was made, speed having been stepped up to Mach 1.6, and altitude to 45,000 feet. The bear was put in a CG position for a heavy man seat down. As we shall see, among the goals of the program was a testing of CG across a broad range to ensure the capsule's adequacy in protecting a maximum percentile of B-58 crewmen regardless of seat adjustment. Initially, the ejection appeared to be a repeat of the first supersonic trial with all systems functioning properly. More violent motions of the capsule than normal were observed after release, especially in the form of a very high pitch-up. Not fully realized at first, the extent of malfunction began to come to light only when a detailed examination of the animal revealed two minor fractures of the pelvic bones, probably from lateral accelerations. A minor hemorrhage in the neck muscles from whiplash action was also found, as well as evidence of nosebleed. These injuries to the animal were, of course, reversible, that is, not of a permanent nature. Taking advantage of a temporary cessation of B-58 flight testing, Capsule personnel undertook a thorough investigation of the problem of pitch-up beyond that expected. Its cause was finally penned down to two trouble areas. First, improper attachment of the channel for stowing the stabilization chute bridle lines, resulting in reduced effectiveness of the chute. Second, the need for an improved rocket thrust line CG relationship. 
In due course, a fix for each problem was devised and a series of tests set up for June, having as their principal objective a definite proving out of these fixes. For the first of these tests, that of 8 June, a chimpanzee took the place of the bear as test subject. Ballast was used to simulate the specified CG position of heavy man seat down. Otherwise, the basic parameters of the bear ejection of some two months earlier were repeated. Speed, Mach 1.6, Altitude, 45,000 feet. With many eyes trained on the carrier B-58, as well as the usual battery of theodolite cameras, the opening moments of the ejection were subjected to especially careful scrutiny. Roll and pitch appeared minimal. 1.2 seconds after release, the pitch rate increased sharply to some 300 degrees per second. Shortly thereafter, the rate decreased and remained very low throughout the rest of the ejection. After impact, an inspection of the stabilization system showed the bridle stowage channel still properly attached to the frame. This fact gave conclusive support to the effectiveness of the fix. The chimp came through the experience in fine shape and the test ejection was considered highly successful. For the next ejection, on June 20th, conditions were deliberately arranged for maximum pitch up in the capsule as an even more demanding test of the corrective measures taken. With the bear again scheduled to occupy the B-58 second station, CG was positioned for a light man seat up. This was in fact to be a test in actual flight of the extreme up CG as measured under experimental conditions on 100 human subjects at Stanley. Altitude was 40,000 feet and speed a subsonic Mach 0.8 in order to accentuate pitch up. During descent, accelerations were as predicted. All systems performed well with the exception of one flower pot which was found not to have repositioned correctly with the boom. The bear suffered no ill effects. The most important result of the test was its demonstration that the latest CG rocket thrust relationship established was effective against pitch up in high altitude, low Mach number ejections. Supplementing the high altitude test just reviewed was the runway ejection of June 22nd. The primary purpose of this test, a repeat of one made under similar conditions in October 1961, was to demonstrate that realignment of the rocket nozzle would not degrade the capsule's trajectory. The subject was again a bear, the CG configuration being heavy man seat down. As per plan, ejection occurred with the aircraft rolling at 100 knots. This test, which saw all systems functioning perfectly and the bear recovered in good condition, gave well-rounded proof of the revised CG rocket thrust relationship by showing its capability for on-the-deck ejections at low speed. For the ejection of 13 July, a speed of Mach 2 and an altitude of 47,000 feet were specified to test the performance of the capsule under these most exacting conditions to date. Two chase planes were assigned for thorough coverage, but only one was able to keep close enough to the Hustler to photograph the test's climax. Fortunately, footage from onboard and ground cameras was good. Although expected under such conditions, the ejection was accompanied by an abnormally large rocket plume, which played on the stab chute more directly and for a longer period than in previous tests, and eventually caused its collapse. Later investigation showed extensive damage by scorching to the peripheral tapes of the chute with its skirt, however, remaining intact. As a consequence, the request was made to the Air Force that HT-1 nylon, a tougher type at high temperatures than normal nylon, be provided for use in the next test ejection. Besides making this mechanical improvement possible at an early stage, the ejection proved out the capsule's capability in two vital performance areas. At the highest speed yet attempted, the unit cleared the tail satisfactorily and displayed such high caliber stability that the bare occupant suffered not the slightest injury.
The policy of testing under widely different conditions, but all of the most demanding character, was continued in the ejection of July 27th. This called for a pressure altitude of 5,100 feet, or 2,500 feet above the terrain, and a speed of Mach 0.92. Essentially, this constituted a repeat under actual operational circumstances of sled runs at 600 knots made early in the program. Stability was good through burnout, and deployment of the recovery chute appeared normal. Two hardware discrepancies were noted, one in the stabilization frame, which failed to reposition properly, the second in the upper recovery chute bridle, which became looped around the right attenuator, or flower pot, causing the capsule to impact on its left side instead of back down. An investigation of the latter malfunction showed stowage of the bridle to be inadequate, and a new configuration was quickly developed. The modified stowage was later thoroughly tested and standardized for production and retrofit. Probably attributable to the improper impacting position of the capsule, internal injuries of some severity to the bear were at first reported. A more complete and careful examination of the animal, however, raised the question of whether these were inflicted during the test or at some earlier time. In any case, the final consensus of medical opinion was that the bear's injuries were reversible. So far, because of time limitations, our story of the capsule's supersonic flight testing has been largely confined to the ejections themselves together with results. The final test of 21 August may perhaps be fittingly used to include some description of the careful preparations and other related activities which of course accompanied all flights in the series. Among these preparations there figured importantly the briefing of key personnel beginning with the basic conditions of the flight which in the case of the final test repeated those of the July 13th ejection. These it will be remembered were Mach 2, 47,000 feet, bear as occupant. Also covered was a host of other essential arrangements such as the formation of the small aerial test armada with special attention to the positioning of chase planes for optimum photographic coverage. On a par with the briefing of personnel was preparation of the capsule. In the area of mechanical change, one highly important modification made for this test was the Substitution of HT1 nylon for regular nylon. As we shall see, its effect on the ejection cycle was due for particularly close observation. Installing all accessories as well as test instrumentation, checking and rechecking of these devices to assure their correct functioning constituted another vital area of preparation. Here, technicians were keenly aware that a full recording of flight data hinged on their meticulous attention to every detail and that on this, in turn, hinged to a large degree the test's success or failure. Next, there was the readying of the test subject through application of a carefully planned series of steps. The administration of pre-flight medication, the adjustment of instruments for recording physical reactions. For maximum protection of the animal and its contributions to the program, each step had to be carried out correctly, meaning in exactly the right place and at exactly the right time. With the carrier B-58 already in prime to go, routine procedure called for a final operational check on the capsule systems, together with a similar check on equipment for measuring such physical factors as the test occupant's EKG and respiration rate. At Sport 1, nerve center for monitoring the entire operation, personnel and recording devices also had to be and were standing by at the ready on the morning of August 21st. Provision was made to land an Aero Medical Officer by helicopter as soon as possible after impact, since by regulations the capsule could be opened only in the presence of a qualified medical representative for the Air Force. After the B-58 had attained its prescribed altitude, Ejection occurred on the dot of the test schedule. As expected, the chute moved into the large rocket plume, but in this case remained inflated rather than collapsing as it had previously.
To supplement footage from the chase planes and from the ground, an Air Force photographer aboard a helicopter covered the descent, following recovery shoot deployment in both moving pictures and stills. During descent, all timing devices and systems functioned according to design, with a single minor exception discovered after impact. As can be seen, the capsule impacted in the proper back-down position. On examination, the stab shoot showed no sign of significant damage. The sole black mark in the functioning of hardware was chalked up by the flotation booms, which overswedged in repositioning. To correct this malfunction, a new configuration has since been incorporated in production and proposed for retrofit. The usual post-flight inspection revealed no evidence of toxic gas. By this date, all production capsules have been changed to incorporate improved plumbing, sealed initiators, and a pneumatic pre-ejection system to ensure that excessive leakage of toxic gas would not recur. As for the bare occupant, she was kept under clinical observation for several days after her flight, following which the customary detailed medical examination was performed. No injuries of any kind were revealed and the animal's overall condition was found to be excellent. By agreement with the Air Force, the ejection of 21 August, the most satisfactory in every aspect to date, brought to a close the supersonic phase of flight testing and of the research and test program as a whole. With the escape capsule being installed in all operational B-58s as of this reporting, the closely knit Air Force industry team could look back on their joint labors with justifiable pride. For these men of the Air Force, together with their colleagues from General Dynamics and Stanley, had established a record of achievement unparalleled in the history of developing escape devices. A record made even more remarkable by the program's ambitious and pioneering nature. Together they could see the escape capsule taking its long-awaited and richly deserved place as a major advance in aeronautical safety.